The following program, The Russ Belleville Show, is intended for responsible adults only. We advocate to the repeal of marijuana prohibition for adults. We discuss the science, culture, and controversy about America's marijuana laws. We do not advocate any illegal activity and encourage all listeners to learn their state and federal marijuana laws. Opinions and claims made by guests and advertisers on The Russ Belleville Show are their own and the Russ Belleville Show cannot be held legally responsible for their validity or reliability. Viewer discretion is advised. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down smooth. Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. <laughs> From the promise of legalization. Uh, and I think that we need to rethink and decriminalize uh, our, uh, our own law. To the agony of prohibition. And one major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. The Rough Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. <laughs> I hear you. You had a question for me. Now, here's your host, Radical Russ Belleville. We love it. Good day, Tokers and Tokets, and welcome to the show. It is Friday, March 7th, 2014, and it's got to be 420 somewhere in the world. Thanks for being here. We made it to the weekend once again, and we're really excited to bring you the latest news, interviews, and views you can use here on the cannabis community's best daily live talk radio show. That's right. The Russ Belleville show coming right at you. And thanks for supporting us at 420radio.org. If you become a VIP member, your monthly donation helps us stay on the air and helps us attend more cannabis community events to bring you back more video. And speaking of more video, the videos will be even better, even better sounding, better looking. We've invested in some new equipment that we'll be taking to the Southern Cannabis Reform Conference. I actually booked the flights today, and because of the vagaries of booking flights and what the costs are, I'm actually going to be in Atlanta for two weeks. That's right, either Atlanta or North Georgia up in Dahlonega, uh, because it's just cheaper to fly on a Tuesday. So we're going to fly the Tuesday before the 22nd. We're going to come back on April 1st, so uh, it'll be a two-week uh, vacation slash working vacation, actually, because we'll be bringing you live shows, live guests from the American South. Really looking forward to that, and big thanks to Peachtree Normal for helping make it happen. All right, on today's show, we're excited because our guest today is our good friend Danny Danko from High Times Magazine. The senior cultivation editor will be joining us in our Cultivator's Corner, where you can call in live at 971-533-7111 and ask your personal grow questions to one of the masters, Danny Danko. So check that out coming up at half past the hour. Also on today's show, we'll have time for a radical rant. The Washington State Patrol has finally released their DU ID numbers for 2013, the first first year of full legalization in Washington State. I'll give you the breakdown of the data, but a little hint, we didn't have a mass rash of DUID arrests. It was not shooting hippie fish in a barrel. Gosh, I can't remember who said that. Hmm, who made that prediction? Ah, the name escapes me. But anyway, uh, we'll have that radical rant for you at the end of the show. Also, we'll go behind the headlines and take a look at a document that was forwarded to me by a 420 radio listener. Apparently, the demands of Minnesota law enforcement on what they would like to see in medical marijuana. Uh, the short story is not much. Also, Herb Thrash will be calling in with a Rockin' Friday song from Black Hell Oil. They'll be his guest, BHO. That's right. They'll be his guest tonight on the Herb Thrasher Flower Hour at 8 p.m. Pacific. Stay tuned. The news is next. The voice of the marijuana nation. The law offices of Omar Figueroa would like to remind you to stand up for your rights. Please do not give up your precious liberties. 
There's nothing wrong with standing up for our constitutional rights, and in fact, it's the best way to honor the Constitution that recognizes our natural rights. Treat law enforcement with respect and respect the Constitution by standing up for your rights. If you are detained or arrested, stand up for your rights by repeating, I respectfully invoke all of my legal and constitutional rights. I do not consent to any search and seizure. I want to remain silent, and I want to speak with my attorney, Omar Figueroa. Omar Figueroa has more than a decade of experience in federal and California courts and graduated from Yale University, Stanford Law School, and Trial Lawyers College. Please contact the law offices of Omar Figueroa at 415-489-0420 or 707-829-0215 or on the web at omarfigueroa.com. 420 Radio, turning red states and blue states green. Cannabis Outreach Collective is an alternative health and wellness option located in Gladstone, Oregon that serves patients in the Portland area and beyond. We are a full-service alternative health and wellness collective accommodating patients with natural, organic, holistic, and homeopathic remedies, nutritional guidance, advice, education, and medical cannabis fully in accordance with Oregon OMMP law. You can find out more about Cannabis Outreach Collective on Facebook at COC503 or by emailing Cannabis Outreach Collective 503 at gmail.com or by telephone at 503 853 1319. Check out our menu on Weed Maps and visit Cannabis Outreach Collective today. This is your 420 Radio News for Friday, March 7th, 2014. I'm Russ Belville. The Oregon Legislature has passed a Senate bill allowing cities and counties to ban newly legalized medical marijuana dispensaries until May 2015. About 300 businesses have applied for the licenses to dispense medical marijuana that were made legal by the legislature last year when regulations were passed to rein in a rapidly growing field of ad hoc dispensaries. Some cities and counties began passing bans on the newly legal dispensaries by forcing them to comport with federal law to acquire a business license. Businesses plan to sue to overturn the bans, and the counsel for the legislature suggested that only the state, not localities, had the right to regulate dispensaries. The just-passed bill addressed that issue, with the Senate rejecting bans in favor of regulations on time, place, and manner of operations, and the House favoring outright bans. The compromise legislation to allow a moratorium until May 2015 passed the Senate 28 to 2. The New Hampshire House has passed a bill that would allow medical marijuana patients to cultivate their own plants. The bill easily passed the House 227 to 73 and would allow any patient who lives more than 30 miles from a dispensary to cultivate one flowering plant, one vegetating plant, and six seedlings in less than a 48 square foot canopy. The bill also increases possession limits from two ounces to six and adds epilepsy, lupus, and Parkinson's disease to the list of qualifying conditions. New Hampshire has no operating dispensaries yet, and the 30-mile HALO rule is similar to Arizona's medical marijuana law, which allowed patients statewide to cultivate marijuana before any dispensaries opened. But as dispensaries have opened in Arizona, patients who were growing had to stop, and now only 6% of the population lives where patients can home grow. Home Grow was removed from the medical marijuana law by the Senate to appease the New Hampshire governor, who still threatens to veto any law with Home Grow. South Carolina's representative has introduced a medical marijuana bill he is calling the Put Patients First Act. House Minority Leader Representative Todd Rutherford told WLTX in Columbia, quote, the time has come to put aside archaic misconceptions of medical marijuana and put patients first. I hear devastating stories every single day from people who are battling epilepsy or suffering from a brain tumor who desperately need medical marijuana to treat the debilitating symptoms, end quote. The bill would create a medical marijuana patient registry for people with cancer, AIDS, glaucoma, epilepsy, multiple sclerosis, and cachexia, and would allow patients to cultivate six plants and possess two ounces of marijuana. 
Another bill that legalizes only high CBD oil advanced to the House Judiciary Committee. South Carolina is one of 14 states that have inactive therapeutic research laws on medical cannabis from the late 70s and early 80s, a point noted by Representative Rutherford. $3 million in statewide funding just isn't a large enough piece of the legalization pie for cops in Colorado. In a letter to Governor Hickenlooper, the Colorado Association of Chiefs of Police complained that the latest budget dispersal of $133 million in tax revenue from medical and legal pot sales fails to earmark any money for local law enforcement. The chiefs want more money to train drug recognition experts to spot stone drivers, to purchase oral fluid collection technologies for impaired driving checkpoints, and the creation of a statewide database of marijuana crimes. According to the chief's letter, quote, Many of our local law enforcement agencies have diverted staff from other operations into marijuana enforcement, leaving gaps in other service areas as a direct result of marijuana legalization, end quote. A Minneapolis City Council member made a stunning plea for medical marijuana that passed a House committee Tuesday. Quote, I have less vision than I should, end quote, explained Minneapolis City Council member Andrew Johnson because his doctor could not prescribe marijuana for his glaucoma. Johnson lined up a row of pill bottles he was prescribed instead. Others testifying included a former police officer who used cannabis as an exit drug from the painkillers he'd become addicted to, a veteran-turned-rehab counselor who lamented the illegality of treating PTSD with cannabis, and a tearful mother who explained how cannabis was the only thing that brought relief to her daughter who died of cancer. One lawmaker proposed an amendment to allow only pill, liquid, or vapor forms of cannabis medicine, but it was voted down in committee. State law enforcement endorses such an amendment, and 420 Radio News has acquired a list of demands from police about medical marijuana, which we will reveal in our next segment, Behind the Headlines. This has been your 420 Radio News for Friday, March 7th, 2014. I'm Russ Belville. Transcripts of 420 Radio News are available at 420radio.org. Visit our website and download today. When we come back, we'll go behind the headlines and take a look at the demand letter from Minnesota law enforcement about medical marijuana. You're listening to the Russ Belville Show on 420radio.org. We'll be right back. Starting up a medical cannabis business, you don't just want any attorney. You want a fired up lawyer who understands the needs of cannabis consumers. The law office of Lauren Vasquez is your fired up lawyer for the cannabis industry. Lauren Vasquez knows the details of California marijuana law from both a personal and professional angle. Lauren Vasquez rose from the ranks of college normal activist to become one of the Bay Area's best marijuana lawyers. Visit her website, firedupmoyer.com, or call 1 855 MMJ Laws for more information. That's 855 665 5297 for Lauren Vasquez, your fired up lawyer, or email firedupplawyer at gmail.com. The number again is 855 MMJ Laws, 855 665 5297 for your fired up lawyer, Lauren Vasquez. Lauren Vasquez is an activist attorney you can trust. Call today. I'm a reefer smoking man. Woodpipe Smoke Shop and Speakeasy is your source for cannabis community gear in southern Wisconsin. Owners Brian and Tammy Wood are located in Kendall, just outside of Madison, and they've got everything for the smoking enthusiast, including a full assortment of pipes, water pipes, hookahs, bubblers, one-hitters, and so much more. They're open noon to 8 p.m. Monday through Saturday and can help you with your detoxification therapies as well. Call 608-466-7473 or email woodpipes at yahoo.com for more information. That's 608-466-7473 or email woodpipes at yahoo.com. And as always, Go Pack Go! Go! 
Welcome back, everyone. Time for us to go behind the headlines and take a look at Minnesota's law enforcement demands on medical marijuana. Uh, we got a hold of this document from a 420 radio listener, sent it out over Twitter, and I'll actually bring this up. You can uh, see the document for yourself. It's uh, basically a letter from the Minnesota Chiefs of Police Association. Minnesota Law Enforcement Coalition is uh, what they're calling themselves here. And let's see. There you go. You can see the letter. <clears throat> and up at the top, the Minnesota Law Enforcement Coalition representing the Minnesota County Attorneys Association, the Minnesota Chiefs of Police Association, the Minnesota Sheriff's Association, the Minnesota Police and Peace Officers Association. It's entitled, The Following Limitations Are Needed in Any Legislation Involving Medical Use of Cannabis. And I think this is important for us to take a look at because, you know, when police take all of those medical courses uh, at the police academy, they get a far better education than the thousands and thousands of doctors in the medical marijuana state. So by God, let's listen to what the cops have to say on medical marijuana. Cause you know, the cops, they don't make the laws. They just enforce them, right? They don't make the laws. They just enforce the laws I except when they're marijuana laws. And then they make up a letter demanding how the laws should be made. So here's what's in the uh, demands here. First of all, I think it's kind of good news actually. It's good news because the cops seem to be resigned to the fact that medical marijuana is inevitable, right? The fact that they're even brokering a letter of how medical marijuana should be enabled rather than if, I mean, that's progress. Let's look, at least take the good out of this, right? And I think it's because, you know, all these stories of families that are getting relief for their kids with marijuana. I mean, when that's moving legislators in Utah and Georgia, <laughs> you know it's got to be a lock in Minnesota. And the cops also aren't trying to claim that if we give a sick kid CBD oil, it's the slippery slope to teenage heroin junkies and free freeway mayhem. So at least that's the good side of this, if you want to take a look at it that way. But the bad news is the cops in Minnesota are demanding that medical marijuana must be extracts, pills, sprays, or vaporization. No smoking, no edibles, no raw plants, no cultivation. They only approve of marijuana products high in TH or high in CBD with quote little to no THC end quote, and just for seizures, cancer, AIDS, and MS. None of this, you know, pain, nausea, spasticity, and cachexia like every other medical marijuana state. So uh, here's the actual lines. Uh, and by the way, if you want to read this, you can. Uh, the link I'll put it up here in the uh, chat room. Here it's uh, at my rad-r.us uh, link, my short link that I always have. And you just type in MN for Minnesota Cops CBD. So rad-r.us/slash MN Cops CBD, and that'll take you to the actual document. You can read along. Here's what they say. They say. Number one, legislation must not allow for use or possession of marijuana in plant form and must not allow marijuana to be sold for medicinal purposes in any food, beverage, or candy form. Number two, legislation may not allow for grow operations of marijuana plants or plant material except as provided in item five below. Number three, CBD with little or no THC extracts in liquid, pill, or vaporized delivery forms may be made available to patients if authorized and closely monitored by a physician. Number four, CBD with little or no THC extracts may be prescribed by a physician for only the following medical conditions, seizures, late stage cancer, glaucoma, multiple sclerosis, or AIDS. I'm sorry, if we caught your cancer early, <laughs> you're just going to have to wait for it to go a little later before you can use cannabis. Number five, legislation may allow such extracts to be purchased from outlets in other states or nations if laws in those jurisdictions permit it. If that is not an option, any production of these extracts within our state must be licensed and limited to medical research institutions as part of a clinical trial. Well, it's going to have to be in research institutions as a clinical trial because you're not going to be able to import as long as it's a federal one, federal schedule one substance. You're not going to be able to import it from Colorado or other states or other nations, right? So it's going to have to be produced by research institutions that will not produce it because they will be in danger of losing their federal funding for their other grants and so on. So basically, point number five means there will be no medical marijuana. And uh, point number six they make, the Minnesota cops, 
Rulemaking must address security and the tracking and dispensing of these prescription drugs. Well, sorry, if they were prescription, this wouldn't be an issue right now. <laughs> That's the thing. If they were prescription, we wouldn't be having this discussion. The fact that it is that they'll be recommended. And they close by saying the implementation and process of how CBD becomes available in the state of Minnesota, you know, not medical marijuana, CBD, is important to members of the Minnesota Law Enforcement Coalition, and we want to be involved in reviewing any language advancing this goal. The Russ Belleville Show, starring Russ Thanks, Belleville Dad. from Portland, Oregon, Thanks, live Dad. Wednesdays Appreciate at 3 p.m. Pacific. Oh, Lee Remainer. <laughs> Sometimes. All right. Well, it's 20 after. It's Friday, so what the hell, right? Hey, boy, right. <laughs> Pookie's in town, and so we're hanging out. We're going to have some of this. Pookie brought a really cool vape pen, so we're going to take a break. We'll be right back. We got Bird Thrasher coming up next. Have you ever met that funny reefer man? Reefer man. If he said he swam to China, he would sell you South Carolina. Then you know you're talking to that reefer man. Let him bring in the beat. Adam Hand of Handmade Apparel produces quality custom designs for t-shirts, hats, and other apparel. Handmade Apparel is the official design shop for 420 Radio, The Russ Belville Show, Ganja John, and Cascadia Concentrates, among many clients who rely on Adam Hand for everything from short-run custom projects to full-run clothing lines. Adam's meticulous designs are individually crafted and screened in vibrant high-definition color. Visit handmadeapparel.biz to browse the selection of handmade gear or to get a personal quote for your own designs. Handmade Apparel, a proud supporter of 420radio.org. Support the Russ Belleville Show. Text the word Russ to 420-420 and connect with the National Cannabis Coalition. You can also send 10 bucks to the Russ Belleville Show right from your smartphone. That's Russ to 420-420. You're listening to Radical Russ on the Russ Belleville Show. knows music and marijuana go together so let's wind up our 20 after break with the russ belleville show's daily toker tunes the best in pod safe 420 music from around the web today is rockin friday featuring rock metal and the hard edge of alternative country now sit back and enjoy your daily toker tune all right everybody we made it to the weekend and that means it's time for a little bit of metal with herb thrasher how you doing herb oh man we're doing great uh beautiful sunny day here in portland oregon today yeah yeah looking forward to it and tonight we've got the herb thrasher flower hour happening 8 p.m to 10 p.m two hours of metal and mayhem and marijuana with me and herb thrasher what's on tonight herb i know you got someone special right yeah we got uh we got some guests from canada that's gonna call in and uh skype with us tonight that is uh who we're also going to play today on the rock and friday but that is black hell oil and also known here in the USA as BHO. Uh-huh. And uh, these dudes are rock stars, and they're going to call in tonight and tell us all about uh, their five-tune EP that they released in early January and uh, talk to us about some other things. Canada, we'll get to find out. Dude, Russ, we'll ask him what's, what was better. What was more satisfying, Olympic gold or Olympic gold in hockey or curling? <laughs> I think I know how they'll answer, but uh, yeah, we'll we'll ask them that for sure. And you know, black yeah. Hell, black hell oil B H O. You know, on uh, Herb Thrasher Flower Hour, we play a lot of what you call stoner rock. You know, Clutch and groups like that. Is this the beginning of dab rock? 
this could be the beginning of dab rock. We might have to turn that, t- turn that, dude. That's a really good one. Uh, we'll definitely, uh, we'll ask him that tonight too. We'll find out all things about Black Hill Oil, and then we'll also uh, listen to. I'll find uh, some new tunes going out there, and then uh, hour two, we're definitely going to pay respects to uh, one of our fallen brothers here, uh, Big Jim Dement. He mm-hmm. was uh, treasurer for the Alabama Medical Marijuana Coalition. And uh, if you guys been listening to Russ's show and my show and just keeping up with the headlines, Alabama and the South in general have been doing a lot of things the past year or so. A lot of headlines coming out of there. And uh, Big Jim DeMint and Alabama Medical Marijuana Coalition have been a big reason uh, that has been happening. And uh, unfortunately, uh, we lost Big Jim uh, the other night. He was a trooper for the Herb Thrasher Flower Hour and just a great friend. He was in our chat room every mm-hmm. Friday night. And, uh, you know, which makes me think, you know, if you guys think about it, we, you know, within the last year, a month and a half, those of us here at 420 Radio, we've lost really two fallen troopers, and that's mm-hmm. Rio and Big Jim. And so let's just pay some respect, celebrate them a little bit, hear some tunes. And uh, we'll have a good time tonight smoking weed and uh, telling good stories. Yeah, and Big and Jim made it into to... uh, the studios uh, here at Rolla J. So uh, he's also been a you know a live you know live guest here as well. He has. He's called in from Alabama before, and he's flown out here. He uh, participated in Hemp Stock. Uh, he came out and just loved Oregon so much. Actually, ended up getting his his card. So he passed away a criminal in Alabama, but he was legal in Oregon and so real proud for him to at least have that satisfaction uh yeah. to knowing that you know he wasn't a hundred percent just a fifty percent criminal <laughs> here in uh the United States. Yeah. And so uh back to Black Hell Oil man, we got some rock for you right now. These dudes, as I said, they put out a twenty one minute five tune E P it released on January third and it's called Smoke You Up. And we did play that tune Smoke You Up back in early January, and them uh, being guests tonight, we thought we'd refresh your minds with this great 5-tune EP. They just signed a, a deal with Heavy, Heavy Ripple's Distribution. And uh, Ripple Music is a really great uh, record label themselves with a lot of great bands that we play. Also, Cody Foster and the Army and uh, just Mothership and just many bands. So Ripple Music doing great things, also working with these guys, Black Hell Oil. They're out of Canada and uh, Saskatoon, Canada. And this tune that we're about to play is Bring It On. It's the fifth song on the five-tune EP. And you guys can check these guys out, blackhelloil.ca for the Canada, or they also have a Facebook page, Black Hell Oil. And they also have a Bandcamp page. And you can go to that Bandcamp and stream these songs in this five-tune EP. And it's only $4, man. So you guys... You like it, man? Support it. This is uh, stoner rock, fuzz rock, uh, high octane rock. It's just rock and roll. So, Canada, you guys blow them up, turn it up. Black hell oil. See you guys tonight.
Support the Russ Belleville Show. Text the word Russ to 420-420 and connect with the National Cannabis Coalition. You can also send 10 bucks to the Russ Belleville Show right from your smartphone. That's Russ to 420-420. You're listening to Radical Russ on the Russ Belleville Show. You can find information for all our 420radio.org shows by visiting the control panel at the top of 420radio.org. Click Schedule to find out the latest times for your shows in your time zone. Click Show Guide to learn more about each show. Thanks for supporting 420radio.org. Egyptians grew it, Indians grew it, so it's called more the cultivation of marijuana can be a therapeutic hobby, a source of medicine, and in some states, a thriving business. Today, we hook you up with the masters of indoor, outdoor, hydroponic, and aeroponic cannabis cultivation. Ask your grow questions in our chat or call in live to 971-533-7111 as we enter our Cultivator's Corner. All right, welcome back, everybody. 34 after the hour, and joining us in the Cultivator's Corner, the High Times Senior Cultivation Editor, Danny Danko. How you doing, Danny? Oh, Russ, I'm great. Thanks for having me, and uh, very excited. Hey, before we get into Cultivator's Corner, I saw a post from our buddy uh, David Kowalski with uh, Cannabis Network Radio and Cannabis Network Media. He's got a show here on 420 Radio as well, but you guys are going to be covering Spanibus, so we better talk about that. Yeah, we're going to be over there in Barcelona, Spain, um, basically not this weekend, but next weekend, the 15th and 16th, um, and the 14th as well. It's a big uh, cannabis fair that they have in Barcelona, which is wonderful, and they, they draw like 20,000 people um, to this great uh, location in the middle of Barcelona, uh, beautiful city, wonderful city for stoners, great food, um, great wine, great architecture. And this fair is just amazing. Like people come from all over Europe basically to show up there. Um, all the big seed companies from Amsterdam and from all over Europe are there. Um, so it's a lot of fun and we're going to go over there and basically, uh, cover the event and, uh, talk to some people in the European breeding industry and find out what's going on. Yeah. And another show that we, uh, play here on 420 radio jorge cervantes tv i'm sure jorge will be there our friend and uh also gordon green who runs our gordon green's music planet uh he lives in barcelona he will be out there recording interviews for us for 420 radio so on the weekend if you can catch it live tune into cannabis network radio and listen to danny and david uh bringing you coverage and then the rest of the next week i'll have recorded interviews from gordon sounds good to me nice. all right yeah that's that's awesome. It is our Cultivator's Corner. We take our live uh, cultivation questions at 971-533-7111. We've also got questions coming in from the chat room. And how do y'all asks a question. He wants to know, I want to be a gorilla grower. Besides not mentioning it in chat rooms, what tips do you have? <laughs> he mentions in our chat room. <laughs> <laughs> um, gorilla growing is an interesting thing because you really... It's all about location. You have to find the right location, and it, it, it might look like a good location in the wintertime or uh, even into the spring and then become a really bad location through the summer and into the fall just based on, um, you know, if there's drought conditions, you could have all the plants around your plants being, like, dry and dead and these big, bright, green, lush, uh, you know, marijuana plants in the middle of kind of, a drought condition as long as you're watering them properly. So, um, you know, it's like I said, it's all about location. The best location, in my opinion, is like uh, the southern facing slope of a hill or a mountain, you know, down low on the mountain a little bit. Um, you're going to get the most amount of sunshine and the least amount of like hikers and hunters and, you know, all that stuff. So, um, location is important. Being able to get water there is important. Being able to not create a trail that leads to your plants is important. Um, I'd say those are, you know, those are those are big. And we have an article in a future issue of High Times coming out about 
growing in drought conditions because with the way that the situation is going right now and uh, climate change, you know, droughts are basically a reality that people are going to have to face. Um, anybody who does any kind of agriculture outdoors is going to be faced with this, and they're being faced with it now since 2012, and particularly this year in California. So um, growing in drought conditions requires being able to use as much rainwater, as much, uh, you know, uh, those little crystals that you can put in the soil that absorb the polymer crystals that absorb water and give off water slowly are great. So um, basically that's what I, that's my advice for the gorilla grower. Mm. You know, we've been hearing these awful reports out of the Emerald Triangle of the drought conditions up there and the uh, Mendocino Sheriff, Tom Allman, going after people that are ripping off water. And I think it's important for us to note to gorilla growers out there that when you uh, dip a PVC pipe into a creek and pump some water out for your plants, that's grand theft natural resources. You need more time for that than the plants sometimes. Yeah, that's absolutely true. But there are, you know, legal ways that you can, well, let's say, um, you know, eco-friendly ways that aren't illegal to get water to your plants. Um, <clears throat> you just don't want to, you also don't want to run pipes from, water sources to your plants because they can be seen from above um, by helicopters and things like that. So, um, you know, rain barrels are a great thing that you can do. Um, you can put a tarp out and collect rainwater uh, on a tarp and get that rainwater into a barrel and save it for the time that you need it. Um, there's, there's a number of different ways. So people can Google that. But the truth is, you know, there are legitimate ways that you can conserve water um, without trying to run it from a creek or a, a river. You know, you mentioned the, the, the climate change that's happening in this in, in this world, and part of what's contributing to that, of course, is the burning of fossil fuels. Oftentimes, it's the burning of coal to produce electricity, and we hear so, so many reports of how much electricity is taken up by indoor growing. Uh, do we have any uh, guidelines or any... Uh, estimates on how much of an impact this is having on the the problem of climate change and how much it would change if we just legalized pot and people could grow it outside. Yeah, well, I know that in California there was a study done um, where they basically concluded that about 1% of their electricity in the state was taken up by indoor growing. And it might not sound like much, but that is really, you know, tons and tons of kilowatts and and hours of electricity that could have been saved. Um, I know for a fact that in places uh, in California, these little small towns, the PSE&G, um, you know, electrical office has to have, uh, you know, uh, trucks that come and pick up the money uh, every two or three days because people pay their bills in cash and things like that. So the truth is we are using way too much electricity and it's based on prohibition. And, you know, this is a plant that wants to be grown outdoors. And I've been preaching lately that I think um, basically the way things are going to go in the future is going to be the best of indoors and the best of outdoors, which is greenhouse growing, um, but smart greenhouse growing, where you have supplemental lighting for when you need it. You have uh, all kinds of control over your environment, which is the best of what you get from indoor. And then you also have the best of outdoor, which is being able to use the sunshine and create a negative carbon footprint because outdoor marijuana plants actually pull carbon from the air and create oxygen. So outdoor marijuana growing has a negative carbon footprint and in the, without, in, you know, without prohibition of marijuana, we can do that. Mm, absolutely. Now, as we start talking about outdoor growing, there's another uh, issue that crops up. <laughs> I couldn't resist. Uh, but <laughs> there's another issue, and, and this uh, came to a head out at the Oregon Cannabis Industry Association. We attended a medical marijuana business 101 seminar, and uh, some of the farmers there had noted that Oregon is moving forward with, you know, this commercial cultivation and possibly moving into legalization with lots of outdoor growing. And Oregon is one of the 10 states that have passed hemp legalization that the feds have now pretty much given the green light, go ahead and grow your hemp. And one of them just Joked, could we just have hemp on the eastern side of the state and medical cannabis on the western, so they don't cross pollinate? How much of a how much of an issue is that? How much of a danger is that that we need to worry about as we move forward with legalization in the hemp versus psychoactive marijuana cross pollinization? 
Well, it certainly is a, an issue because uh, you don't want to muddy up the gene pool. And, you know, typically hemp is a low THC, high fiber kind of plant. And, you know, the cannabis we want to grow is high THC and hopefully low fiber. And, you know, if those things get mixed up, if, if hemp pollen reaches, you know, high THC cannabis fields, you, you will have an issue eventually. Um, you'll have seeded pot that ends up with kind of muddy genetics. And so it is important to keep those two things separate. And it's one thing, you know, it's one of the high class problems I guess we have uh, in the yeah. face of legalization is, well, how are we going to keep uh, the hemp crops from seeding the marijuana crops and the marijuana crops from seeding the hemp crops? But there are ways, like I said, if you're going, if you're doing it indoors in a greenhouse, you can have uh, filtration systems. Um, you know, I'd have to look into what type of micron size filtration you would have, but you would really want to have very, very uh, strong filtration systems with very low pore uh, counts that you would be sucking your air in from, and also the air that you would be removing from your grow room as well would be going through um, super filtration. And so that's important, and that's one of the reasons why controlling the environment is important and, uh, you know, capitalizing on the benefits you can get from being indoors. Um, so, and hemp, of course, is going to be grown outdoors completely because the only way to make money from hemp fiber or hemp seed oil or anything like that is really just to grow that stuff, you know, in massive, massive acres and acres of outdoor fields. And, and that's the way that would be done. So basically we as, as indoor marijuana growers are going to have to step up our game when it comes to filtering the air that we bring into our grow room to avoid cross-pollination. Mm, wow. It's going to be, it just opens up a whole new uh, area in marijuana cultivation. And I'm sure it'll, it'll create jobs too. Somebody's going to have to build those filtration systems and sell them. So, you know, there we go. That's how we'll deal with it. Danny, you're so busy, man. I mean, you're headed to Spain for Spanibus here in a, in a week. And then when you come back, you got to get ready for 420 in Denver, where High Times is presenting the U.S. Cannabis Cup. Uh, any preview or information you can give us on Denver? You know, I'm almost scared to promote the event because it's been <laughs> uh, <laughs> the sales of the tickets have just been ridiculous. We have a much larger venue. We have the Denver Mart. I know they're doing the AGE uh, glass trade show on the, uh, I would say, I think it's the 16th, 17th, and 18th of April, so that Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Then, you know, that Friday night we move in. Our Denver Cup is Saturday and Sunday. Sunday is the, you know, 420 in Denver. I can't imagine how epic that's going to be. We search every night um, Ice Cube on Friday, Slightly Stupid and Max Miller on Saturday, and uh, I believe Snoop Dogg and Wiz Khalifa on Sunday. Wow. At, uh, yeah, so, I mean, those aren't high-time shows. Those are just shows that are in town that we have uh, some of our access to for our super VIPs and stuff. But it's going to be crazy. We're anticipating right now, you know, many, many thousands of people. Luckily, you know, we have a bigger venue. We were very happy with, you know, the venues in the past. But we're, we, you know, we just outgrew that place. And so we're really excited about being at the Denver Mart. We have an outdoor medicating area, recreating area. Um, I'm doing a, a, a big seminar that Sunday, the 20th, um, right before 420, on 420. So, yeah, we're just, we're pumped. It's going to be a huge event. Uh, we just want to show the world how, you know, cannabis consumers get together and celebrate and, uh, you know, show the best of our industry yeah and we'll be there too 420 radio uh with a booth uh the 420 radio drug test game show and apparently i'll be giving a presentation so this will be a good one danny thanks for calling right, cool. in we appreciate it have fun at spanibus and we'll see you in denver my man thanks for having me and uh free the weed free the weed all right folks stay tuned radical rants coming up next we got duid stats from washington state stick around We'll be right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the Russ Belleville Show. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Yes. 
420 Radio. Tune in, turn on, get high. Somebody has to say something. activists for 40 years. We are turning the corner on a failed policy that's been disastrous for our communities um, and things are going to get better. 80 years ago we repealed alcohol prohibition in this state. We did it prior to the federal government and we're doing the same thing when it comes to marijuana. We are uh, a step ahead and we will continue to lead the way. It means I'm going to smoke a lot of weed tonight. Woo! Some call it marijuana. You're listening to Radical Russ on the Russ Belleville Show. Never mind. Legalize me. You want answers? I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. You want answers? You have offended my family. I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth. And you have offended a Shaolin temple. You the truth. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Well, folks, that day I've been waiting for has finally arrived. I told you when uh, Washington State passed I-502, legalizing the possession of an ounce of marijuana, that I would be awaiting the day they released the DUID statistics for 2013. For those of you who haven't been following along, if you'll recall, back in 2011 and 2012, we had numerous people who were pot smokers, basically, who were against I-502, who did not want to vote for and oppose the legalization of marijuana. And one of their talking points, one of their prime talking points was how the DUID law was, how, oh my God, there's a five nanogram per se limit, and we would be, quote, shooting hippie fish in a barrel, end quote, outside of Seattle Hemp Fest, just picking off people. Everybody who ever got a a, a pot possession arrest was now going to turn in to a DUID arrest because now the cops would have this new tool to be able to impose their will on stoners. So we got the data now. The Washington State Patrol has actually released their impaired driving data for the entire year of 2013, the first year of legal possession in Washington state and project Sam, the misnamed smart approaches to marijuana, or as I like to call them, the campaign to rehab all potheads project crap. Uh, they are claiming that this recent data shows that marijuana legalization have made the road has made the roads in Washington state incredibly dangerous. There's stone to mayhem on the freeways in Washington state. The world's gone to hell in a handbasket. And the reason why is they point to this one data point. They point to, the number of people who have tested positive for THC, marijuana's psychoactive ingredient. Now, I have this data because you know me, I look shit up. And let's see if I can get the right picture here. Was it this one? Was it this one? There we go. All right, so we've got our data here from Washington State. Percentage of total driving cases confirming positive for THC. Oh, you would do that, wouldn't you? Right when I was right when I got it perfect, perfectly aligned. Percentage of total driving cases confirming positive for THC. Now this is active delta nine THC. This is not metabolites. As we look at the data, you got 2009 through 2013, and the number has risen from 4,800, 5,000, 5,100, 5,300, just about to now 5,468 impaired driving cases that were received for testing. So more people being pulled over and suspected and tested for impaired driving. Now that's to be expected as they pass this new law 
they're going to take advantage of it. They're going to turn in more tests. And here's what Project Sam wants you to freak out about. A quarter of those tests were positive for THC. Now that's up from 18% the year before, 18.6, 20 the year before, 19 the year before, 18 the year before. We're now up to 25. So we're supposed to freak out here. It's a 33% increase. That's why we're supposed to be scared. A 33% increase. Okay. But of course, you know what the answer to this is, right? We got more people testing positive for THC because more people are using marijuana. And the presence of THC in a positive test does not say anything about whether someone was impaired. In fact, this positive testing is for everyone that was above two nanograms per milliliter. The cutoff now is two nanograms. So remember their legal limit is five. So a lot of these people that are in this statistic are people that weren't considered legally impaired. Now, a way to confirm this, if the hypothesis is that there's just more people smoking pot, we can compare another number. Table two tells us the percentage of total driving cases confirming positive for carboxy THC. Carboxy THC, of course, is the metabolite, the inactive metabolite that tests positive for months later or weeks later, days later, some people up to a month or two. That number goes from 2009 to 2013. And again, the same number of samples received for testing. Previous years, 2009, 2010, all the way through 2012, it was about 28%. About 28% of the uh, samples tested positive for THC. 2013, it was 40%. We went from 28% metabolite positives to 40% metabolite positives. That tells me we got a whole bunch more people smoking pot. That's an increase of 39% in carboxy uh, uh, positives compared to the 33% increase in active positives. So all I see is more people smoking pot. And part of what confirms that and again, this is the graph that they've supplied, the red line being the uh, impaired driving cases for carboxy and the blue line impaired driving cases for uh, Delta 9, for active. But here are some numbers that I think are even more telling. Number of THC positive driving cases that were above 5 nanograms per milliliter. Remember, 5 is our limit, right? Okay. In 2011, half... 49% were above the legal limit. In 2012, 62% were above the legal limit. This year, it was, seven, it was 53% above the legal limit. So yes, there are more people that had been caught above the legal limit at 720 compared to 610 the year before. But the ratio of how many of them were over the limit has dropped to 53% from 62 the year before. So... Cops are giving out more tests, but fewer of the people comparatively are over the limit than they were before. And another confirmation of that comes from this table at the very bottom that shows us the summary of THC blood concentrations from driving cases. This tells us the range of what the THC concentration was. Now, from 2011 and 2012, they were testing down to one nanogram. Now they're testing from two. The range they found for 2013 was two to 77 nanograms per milliliter. The year before was one to 90. So what we're seeing here is people are less high behind the wheel than they were the year before. That's also confirmed by the average THC concentration, which has dropped from 8 nanograms to 7.2, and the median, which has dropped from 6.2 to 5.2. The median, the median concentration, a median means there are just as many people below that as above that. Another way to look at it, at 5.2, we're almost to the point where half the people are below the legal limit that we catch. And we'll see if that continues to go down. Now, Jacob Sullum in Reason, Mag in, uh, Reason Online, actually, has written about this as well. And he also points out something very interesting here. And that is, if more Washingtonians are smoking pot, more drivers will test positive for THC. But 
Pot smoking will mean less drinking, could mean less drinking. If so, the net result would be fewer traffic fatalities because alcohol is so much more impairing than cannabis is. And to back these numbers up, we have another interesting data chart that shows us the DUI arrests in the state of Washington and the report data. Now, this breaks down to DUIs for alcohol that took a breath test versus DUIs for alcohol that got a DUI without a breath test, right? Like they just failed the, you know, walk the straight line, whatever. We also break down DUIs for drugs. Now, this is all drugs, not just pot. And DUIs for drugs with and without the test, right? So without the test could be, you know, you were driving so impaired and your eyes were so bloodshot, they just gave you DUI and arrested you there. Versus a DUI with a drug test, those would be the people that are getting caught for the five nanograms or more. All right, now as we look at these numbers, they start at 2009 and range through 2013. Lo and behold, total DUIs for alcohol went down from 17,000 to 15,000. And the total DUIs for drugs of any kind went down from 1,600 to 1,300. And if we take a look at all of the statistics as far as fatalities, accidents, and so forth, whether it's per 100 million miles driven or per capita, Washington State continues to see a decline in such accidents, injuries, and deaths, and sees a decline at a rate greater than, and numbers currently lower than, the U.S. national average. But because of that, that leads Patrick Kennedy to say, this is a wake-up call for officials and the public about the dangerousness of this drug, especially when driving. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> the reefer madness from Mr. Kennedy. That's all the time we got for Hour 1. Stay tuned for Hour 2. We got Representative Cohen tearing apart the DEA again. For Brian the Red, I'm Radical Russ. Until next time. This is the Russ Belleville Show. Take care of each other, tokers. The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com.